Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for the book, months of October, November, and December of 2016 is on the book of Job. That's quite a challenging book, as you probably know, and it has some incredible insights. So I hope that you've been enjoying this series as much as we have. This is lesson number 10 in that series, entitled, The Wrath of Elihu. It's a lesson for December 3 of 2016. And as usual, we're going to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray to start uh, our lesson. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to open your word, to think about you, to see what you have to say to us through these particular passages that we're focusing on for today. May they be a blessing not only to us, but to all those who have a chance to tune in to our presentation as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we have now come to the end of the three cycles going through from Job to Elihu, Job to Zophar, Job to uh, Bildad, and then they've gone through that cycle three times, Job responding, so forth. And where have we gotten so far? Did either side win their case? Stalemate. Yeah. Stalemate. <laughs> Pretty much. It's about where we are so far, right? It's kind of a stalemate. They were sure they were right. And remember, we, we, we don't stop to ask ourselves or to point out sometimes, they believed that they were representing the truth about God seems incredible to us well, from what we know in, in Job 1 and 2, but they, believe, they firmly believed they were representing the truth about God. Um, our Bible study guide suggests we have a look at Proverbs 25, verses 11 to 13. An idea well expressed is like a design of gold set in silver. A warning given by an experienced person to someone willing to listen is more valuable than gold rings or jewelry made of the finest gold. A reliable messenger is refreshing to the one who sends him like cold water in the heat of harvest time. You think those words could describe any of what we've heard so far in the book of Job? <laughs> Probably not, huh? Well, when words are appropriately spoken in the right context, with consideration to the situation, they can be a real blessing. But uh, what's happened so far in this book hasn't been very helpful. So what comes next? A young man by the name of Elihu jumps in and adds his words of wisdom to the discussion. Um, I think before we jump into Elihu's speech, we need to remember Job 15. Can any human being be really pure? Can anyone be right with God? Now, this is a theme of Elihu's. Why God does not trust even his angels. Even they are not pure in his sight, and people drink evil as if it were water. Yes, they are corrupt. They are worthless. Where do those words come from? Satan. Satan. How do you know that? It's kind of a replay of what was back in uh, chapter yep. 4. Yeah, exactly. This was words almost verbatim out of the, the uh, presentation that the devil gave to Job back in chapter 4. And it's attributed to, to Eliphaz again. Yeah, same, same guy. So contrast these words from Job 19, spoken by Job, but I know there is someone in heaven who will come at last to my defense. Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes, and he will not be a stranger. Um, does that suggest, what, what kind of a, a relationship does that suggest that Job had with uh, God? He trusted him. Yeah. Okay. He must not have been seeing him right then, because he says, I will see him. Yeah. Well, he's talking about, in the context, you know, at that point in time, he's talking about he's going to die. He thinks there's, there's no way he can survive much longer. He's just going to die. But he says, don't worry. I will see God. 
So, well, all four of the, these participants, Job and his three friends, really believe that they are speaking on God's behalf. Job makes a final speech in Job 26 to 31 that we need to look at briefly. Um, but let's stop. We have to be very clear about one point before we jump in. What was the reason for this whole discussion and what was the reason for the whole book of Job? How did it all start? Just to review. Satan had accused uh, God of not being, uh, treating himself right. Re really was talking about himself is yeah. what, what Satan was doing. That's what he always likes to talk yeah, about. Yeah, what his favorite person. But technically speaking, it was God who first said something to Satan, wasn't it? In, in the book. Now, we don't know what may have preceded that. But God said to Satan, what? Because have you looked at my servant Job? Job yeah. And why did God point out Job? Because Job was an evil guy? Righteous and upright person. No, so this whole book is about the fact that Job was a righteous and an upright guy. There wouldn't, I mean, would there have been any reason for the book of Job if Job were no different than anyone else? No. There would be no reason to even have the book here. So, whereas Job's three friends kept saying, the reason this is all happening is because you're so evil. No, in actual fact, the reason this is all happening is because you're so righteous. Think about that. So that's one of the big challenges we're going to try to understand as we move along. Well, did Job's friends, you think, have any idea at all that those words that came to Eliphaz in the middle of the night came from the devil? What did they, yeah? Not really. Yeah. They, they were pretty sure that they knew. It fit with what, what their, I'm sure it fit with what their ordinary understanding was before they, 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 the whole thing happened. So, it must be from God, right? It fits what, with what the world believes. Yeah, exactly. Not a whole lot different than what has been going on for the last couple thousand years. Yeah. That's right. The, the philosophy is not much different than it was 4,500 or 3,500 years ago. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you, and we're going we're to jump back and forth here a little bit. You know that at the end of the book, Job 42, 7 and 8, God said, I am angry with you, speaking to Eliphaz, he addresses him specifically, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. I want you to try to picture the scene right there. Presumably, Job is still there. The three friends are still there. And God speaks these words. Who was the most shocked by, what, by those words? Maybe that maybe all of them. <laughs> maybe all of them. That's very very likely true, because uh, Job has just repented, right? He thought, well, you know, I thought I was on your side, God. I thought I was representing you correctly, but yeah, Gary, were you going to comment? You just said Job repented. That's what it says in the right there no. in the text, Job forty and Job forty-two, first six so verses. So does that mean he did something wrong? No. Well, that's that's what many scholars say. Job, Job was a sinful, terrible, in fact, even our Bible study guides seem to suggest that Job was self-abhorrent because he's sort of, he's recognizing now that at least, if he's not a terrible sinner, at least he's so far away from God that, you know, he, he shouldn't have been speaking up so much as the way he did, he did. Does that seem like a fair presentation? Well, so the issue is whether Job was righteous? Well, that's what God said in the beginning. That's right. I'm, well, I'm just quoting what God well, said. Well, that's true, but I wonder if, if that is the issue. Maybe Job had an idea about God that was right that needed to come out. Okay. Well, but I mean, if you have the right ideas about God, you're, you're well on your way, I hope. Well, that's true, but... Um, Okay. I, I, I'm just saying that there's yeah. two things here. Well, Are we talking about Job being righteous as we look at him like we look at Jesus? Mm -hmm. You know, we, is Job that righteous that we can look at him? Or well, that's a, is, does Job have something that he understands about God mm -hmm. 
that the other people don't. That's and what it boils, boils down to, I would think. I think we need to remember who is pronouncing who yeah. righteous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not humans who are pronouncing him righteous, it's right. God. It's God. And that doesn't mean that he is righteous because he's totally righteous. It's right, he is righteous because God knows his heart and he knows where he is going with his life. Exactly. And furthermore, he knows, God knows, and we, we, we've spoken before about God's foreknowledge, God knows that Job is not going to let him down. Because what if, what if we've gotten halfway through the book and all of a sudden God's, Job just gave up? There wouldn't be any point of it, would there? The whole thing would be, would be useless. I don't think God would have picked him if there was any no. doubt about him. He certainly wouldn't have yeah. made the comment he yeah. did about him back in the beginning. So, for whatever reason, we don't know about Job's former life. We'll find out about that in the future, I'm sure, and we'll get to heaven. But what we do know is that God said that Job was righteous. And how many translations, how many books on the book of Job have picked up on that? <laughs> I have yet to find one. Mm -hmm. And this lesson study guide is, seems to be no exception, Yeah. sadly. Yeah. I, I still don't know where, you know, when you say somebody's righteous, I'm not saying What that does that mean? God is saying I know, no, but what, what does, does mean? he mean by that? Does he mean that, does he mean that no matter what Job does, he's going to do everything right? Or does it mean that he's telling the truth, that he's got some idea that is correct? Yeah. And if he's correct, he's called righteous because he's right. It's, it's, it's what Paul would call the perfecting of the saints. Yeah, yeah. So he's righteous at that time, in that situation, yeah. it doesn't mean that he's sinless. He is no. on his way and, go ahead. out of sin. I was going to say, and, and Job ne never claimed that he was sinless. He, right. I said, I'm a sinner. He says that in a number of places. But he says, I have not committed the terrible crime, whatever it was, that you guys think I've, I've committed. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And, and the reason why they thought that is because of his condition. Yeah, exactly. Which, which if you isn't really a bad deduction, if you don't well, think, at, at that time. Yeah, if, if, you, with, if you didn't know anything about chapter 1 and 2, you might be inclined to think that. So that's the, those are the things we struggle with. Apparently, we would say Job said good things about God. He presumably, God knew him well enough, he knew that he wouldn't flake out in the middle of the whole experiment, and he was righteous. He talks, and that's why I, I wish we had a whole chapter on, a whole lesson on Job 36 to, uh, 26 to 31. He talks about, I fed the orphans, I took care of the widows, I went out of my way to help anybody who was hurting, I stood up for the, the people who were, who were, you know, misrepresented in court, etc., etc. I mean, you know, these are, these are things that you would expect a righteous person to do, right? I mean, you know, he, we don't have every detail about his life, obviously, but those are, those are pretty good indications. The theology of the four friends was the same kind of theology you can get from most TV channels yeah. and most religious uh, pro programming, or in probably most pulpits, which is instant wealth, instant health, and fire insurance. Yeah. yeah. But, that's but that's all they have to peddle. But my question is, what standard could you look at to tell those people were wrong, those three friends were wrong. We'll have to ask God that someday, because He's the one who did it. Okay, that's, that's just always a good way out. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> I have so. a question, and I'm asking the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and what I, you I, do, I, oh, I guess we'll have to ask God someday. Well, I, unfortunately, it's we don't know me. enough about his previous story. That's why I wish we had a whole lesson on, because Job 26 to 31 is where he talks about what he what he was doing in the past. He says all those things, and I've I've mentioned several of the things he talks about already. Um, and I don't know why we don't mention yes. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. uh, I think that uh, Eliphaz and his friends are adopting what we would call today a Skinnerian approach yeah. to education. It's the reward for doing the right thing, and so on. And this is the way the world operates, the way our courts operate, mm -hmm. which is not the way of God. Yeah. Job had a different view of God, mm -hmm. and that's what made him different from all the rest of them. Yeah. So that's not the way of God? No, it's not, because you could very well do very good things with the 
wrong purpose in mind. Yeah. Uh, wow. You take the Ku Klux Klan, they have fed a lot of people and they have uh, done a lot of uh, but social but, but deeds. But what are they going to do? Uh, who's going to get into heaven and who isn't going to get uh, into heaven? That's the heart. God knows the heart and he knows the heart of God. Well and that's then, the why are we watching a judgment? Well, the judgment is another question. <laughs> yes. No, I don't think so. I think we're talking about everything here. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me just clarify one for, for you people who are r r running through your Bible really quick to go to Job 26. <laughs> there's a couple of things we have, to, we have to mention. If you have one of the older versions of the Bible, it will not mention who's doing the speaking. And that makes it a little bit complicated. So you need a modern version, and, and the Hebrew is pretty good at indicating who's doing the talking. But in Job between 26 and, 20 and 31, there's some stuff, and I, want, I would just like to point it out. It is important in reading this section of Job to realize that there are portions for whom the original speaker is not known for sure. Some feel that Job 26 verses 5 to 14 is the speech of Bildad. Some feel that Zophar is the speaker of Job 27, 7 to 10, and 13 to 23. Traditionally, these portions have all been attributed to Job. That makes Job uh, apparently contradict himself. So how do we go about deciding for sure who, give, who gave these speeches? Now, I said some parts is very clear who, who gives the speeches. But if, if, if uh, here's five verses here and another five verses that disagree with each other, is the speaker just confused or is this a different person speaking? I, th I think we really have to be careful with that question mm -hmm. because if you go into the Septuagint mm -hmm. and read the book of Job, you get a very different picture. That's correct. And that picture of Job is one that is much more clearly uh, in, uh, given by the Septuagint, and it does correspond with the New Testament, which is entirely quoted on the Septuagint as well. Yeah. And those contradictions are not as strong as they might appear from the Masoretic text. So the question, of course, then is, why is that? Did those people who translated from the Hebrew to the Greek back in the beginning, down there in Egypt, presumably, if we understand, if we believe the story, did they have an earlier, more accurate form of the Hebrew? Or did they say, well, we need to fix this up, and they changed it as they were translating? And that's a tremendous challenge, and, and it's, um, it's one of the things that the Bible scholars have to struggle with. But thank you for pointing that out. So if we go on in chapters Job 28 and 29, again, it's pretty clear. Actually, let me read the first few verses of of Job 20, 26, and you'll see uh, what I'm saying about Job. What a fine help you are to me. This is Job's final speech. Poor, weak man that I am. You give such good advice and share your knowledge with a fool like me. What do you think will hear all these words? Who inspired you to speak like this? <laughs> he, he's kind of tired of all that stuff they've been speaking. And then if you jump down past the part that's Presumably, the rest of Job 26 is probably Bildad. Job 27, I swear by the living Almighty God who refuses me justice and makes my life bitter, as long as God giveth me breath, gives me breath, my lips will never say anything evil. Now, does that make him righteous? James probably would have thought so from the New Testament. <laughs> he says, if, you, if, you're, if your lips don't speak anything evil, you're a righteous man. My tongue will never tell a lie. I will never say that you men are right. I will insist on my innocence to my dying day. And he's thinking that could come pretty soon. I will never give up my claim to be right. My conscience is clear. May all who oppose me and fight against me be punished like the wicked and the unrighteous. What hope is there for the godless in the hour when God demands their life? When troubles come, when will God hear their cries? They should have desired the joy he gives. They should have constantly prayed to him and, and so forth. So. Job was pretty fed up with um, the speeches of, of those three friends by that point in time. Well, he probably didn't feel very well either. No. It wasn't worth <laughs> it. Wasn't <laughs> so back partly to your question, Gary, how do you think Job became righteous? 
through faith. Righteous man shall live by faith. Okay. Back at well, remember, he lived in a time where there was no Bible, there were no churches, there were no pastors, there were no prophets that we know about. There might have been a prophet that we don't know about, but I mean, so I'm not absolutely ruling that out. But in those circumstances, how do you develop a solid, trusting faith in God? I think we need to look at verse 4 that you just read of mm -hmm. chapter 27. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue under deceit, utter deceit. Mm -hmm. In the Septuagint, we have a little bit different flavor. Yeah. Neither shall my soul meditate mm -hmm. unrighteous thoughts. Yeah, okay. Very good. <laughs> Very interesting difference between yeah. the two yeah. texts here. And by the way, we ought to remember that the Septuagint is the Bible that Jesus quoted. Yeah. And the, what we call the Masoretic text wasn't until, until about 800 years later, yeah. after Jesus so, was and I, I have to sort of question what you just said a little bit. Jesus was probably speaking mostly Aramaic. I understand. But, and, but his, the Bible writers, the New Testament writers, quoted the, the Septuagint. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> So, do we, do we believe that God was communicating with Job before this whole experience? Yes. Obviously. Yes. Yeah, he, he must have been. And how might he have done that? Face you think? to face even. What? Possibly even face to face as he did with uh, Possible. Uh, Abraham. Abraham and yeah. uh, Moses. And we, so we could have angel, we could have God doing that, we could have angels doing that. Um, could have dreams or visions. Yeah. Well, and why not just kind of think logically and actually well, look at life and kind of derive it from what you're seeing and having the Spirit with you? That's, what's, what's wrong with that? I mean, why well, do we have to have somebody come down and start talking okay, to you or, but, but or hold going on just doing a dreams you're, over you're, you? You're, 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 is, you're thinking in terms of somebody who has had lived Christianity all their lives and it seems normal to you. Yeah, that was advice. not... Can a man by searching find out God yeah. is a rhetorical question. Totally yeah. different society. The question is we that well, how searching mm -hmm. so, so of itself does not produce an understanding of God. God needs to reveal himself. So, so to do that, he's got to come and show up and be a person and actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with him. That's what uh, Jesus came to do. That's right, but I'm, we're talking about Job here, and Job didn't see Jesus. Yeah, but well, so we, we, have the, we have the experience of Enoch, where very clearly God walked with him. We have the experience of Abraham, which was about the time of Job. So we're, we're drawing some, what we think are rational conclusions based on experiences from that, that period of time. Yeah, that's and, good for you, but it's not for me. Okay. Well, th there's uh, <laughs> also the possibility that the book of Job may have been written long before the flood, for that matter. It may have been the gospel yeah. pre-flood. And uh, yeah, some of the words and geographical places might have been changed to fit the, the, the area. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a message that was known before the flood. Even Noah, until he went into the ark, was preaching that very message. Mm -hmm. And early after the flood, a lot of people knew that message and many departed from it willfully. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that God had to speak face to face to him. The Word of God has always been available to humanity. Well, that's one of the questions. Did Job learn what he learned? Did he become the righteous man that he was, a la God's speech, from something he heard from others? Because he talks about that. He says, others have said to me, have talked to me about you. Um, and he does say at the end, what does he say? He so says, Job, I've heard, that's why I've I was just heard all this stuff, but now... I've seen. I've seen, yeah. or whatever, maybe the other way around. Okay, we earlier talked about whether Job considered himself a sinner. Look at Job 31, verse 33. Others try to hide their sins. I have never concealed mine. He, he, he's not trying to say he's sinless. But obviously, and I, I think that I think you'd have to have some incredible experience with God in order to stand up with, through what Job stood up to. I don't think that's just, oh, well, just sort of an ho-hum experience. Uh, well, when you got your four friends and your wife yeah. and, uh, and then all the bad things that have happened to you, it's... It 
Okay, now we're going to come to one of the really challenging questions of this lesson. There are many people who take the approach that faith is something that God gives, it to, gives to you. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. That, we, that our righteousness is imparted or imputed. We don't have any righteous of, righteousness of our own of any kind. It's all given to us by God. So was Job actually abandoned by God during this whole experience? Or did the Holy Spirit and the heavenly angels surround Job to protect him from the devil? And if they had done that, I mean, who said, okay, remember God back in the beginning, he said, you can do what and you can't do what? Take his kill life. Him. You can't kill him. You can, you can take all his possessions, his children, etc., but you can't kill him, okay? So who, who monitored that? Who said, okay, Satan, there's the wall? He knew where the boundary was, didn't Satan? Well, if Satan complained at the beginning that you put a hedge around him. Yeah. How, how are we going to know what he's really like or what he's really thinking? And so God opened up that hedge a little bit and let him... That, that's, well, that's the question. What does that hedge consist in? What, what is it made of? Is this, is this, well, I got is it, the idea. I know what he means by that. I can't really tell you if there's anything physically that was put around him. Yeah. But Probably he's been physical. being protected, that's for sure. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how, but whatever it was, it was keeping Satan okay. back. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to think about it very carefully. Is faith something that somebody else does for us? What? The reason I'm asking that is we call it a gift of God. Ephesians 2 8 says, For it is by God's grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. So if, if it is a gift, does God just arbitrarily, I'm going to give you this much and that much and somebody else this much and more? How does that work? James says, a measure of faith. Okay, yeah. Another, another expression. Well, what are you what, talking about? Well, the what reason parts of the gift that you're talking about. That's what I'm. That's what I'm asking you. You can having Satan go through the hedge doesn't isn't really a good gift. <laughs> no, it isn't. Well, so here's the question: Would that suggest that when we say we have faith and trust God, that God is really speaking through us and thus speaking to Himself? Well, Paul said, for I have died and yet I live, yet it is not I that live, but Christ lives in me, which okay. kind of brings us into the same kind of state of mind. So is it, so when Paul says, you know, in my, in my flesh, I see no good thing, mm -hmm. uh, and identifying himself as the flesh, then he's talking about uh, walking, you know, in Romans 8, where he talks about uh, Christ setting him free, to walk after the spirit, uh, but it it would seem to be that he still thinks of himself as walking after the spirit. Yeah, and he says in Galatians that we should uh, no uh, be not deceived. Uh, God is not mocked; for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So yeah. there are there are all these texts that do seem to give a sense of personal responsibility about the actions that we do. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it really comes down to the choice. If we have no choice, if God weren't there, we would just do whatever evil, uh, self-centered thing we could. But with God there, by beholding Him, we can be changed and transformed. He He becomes the source of our the source of our actions. Here's here's the question: Can a person actually be righteous himself? By whatever means. I'm not saying without God's help. I'm saying with God's help, can you become righteous? Because if, if God, if this whole book is about, okay, God comes along and says, I'm going to randomly pick you. And I'm going to give you this righteousness. And then we're going to experiment on you. That, that, that just doesn't, I mean, the whole book would just be sort of just craziness. Yes. Well, it, and, and God starts out by saying he's righteous. Now, I, I have to add, almost all scholars, including many of our church, believe that there is no way that Job could have been righteous himself. 
Well, um, it goes back to my original question. What do you mean by righteous? Are you talking about he's got the right answer for something, or is he walking well, around I'm, pious? I'm going to stick my neck out enough to say that I believe that means that if God, if Jesus had come the second time right at that point, Job would be saved. Well, what's so hard about that? Well, we, we know that a very small percentage of people are ultimately going to be saved. Very small percentage. We do? Well, look at the story of Noah. And it says, Jesus himself said to us, as it was in the days of Noah, eight people were saved out of millions. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also be at the coming of the Son of Man. Do you so think he's talking about numbers there, or is he talking well, at about least partly. the attitudes he's that a, people had back then? That's what I'm kind of getting from that. Well, that might, be the, that might be the basis for the numbers, but the numbers is also a part of it. Okay. So, I don't know about that, but yeah. I'll take that into consideration. Was Satan in Job 1 and 2 saying that Job was not justified? or could not be justified, or that God could not forgive Job, or that God couldn't declare Job to be upright? Hadn't God already declared Job upright? Right. Was God lying then? No. no. Again, he knew the heart. Mm -hmm. And he knew in what direction Job was going. Mm -hmm. And that is enough for God yes. to know that he would end up in the right place, just like the thief on the cross. He could tell him, you will be with me. Yeah. Why? Because he knew what the heart of that man was right there on that. Cross. Okay, so here's... Right. And yeah. that's what Satan... And Satan didn't dispute the fact, uh, what God said about him being righteous. He says it, it's only because you put a hedge around yeah. him. If, you know, and so yeah. uh, all that stuff was removed down to don't take his life, and he still maintained his integrity. Yeah. So this whole thing is about how long you can last under torture. Um, partly. Partly? Yeah. Okay. So, he, and here's the, here's the, 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 you know, your question, you're talking about righteousness. Is it possible to come to the place where when you say that you trust God, because that's the ultimate question, it is actually you speaking? Yes. This is a huge theological <laughs> divide among, but I absolutely believe it is. Isn't that what we're aiming for on the over? I hope so. So what's the idea of the other way around? Well, the other way around is we're, we're, we're poor, pitiful creatures here, and the only reason we can do anything is because God gives us the power to do this, and we only speak on his, you know, only speak because God somehow gives us the speech. There are a lot of people who believe that. So well, that's Calvinism, so the, the power, yeah. basically. God gives them the power to be righteous. Yeah. Okay. Well, his word gives us the power to yeah. become righteous. His words he has spoken. way of life, mm -hmm. his philosophy of life is what makes it possible for us to grow in righteousness. Mm -hmm. And a person who is righteous, as Job was pronounced righteous by God, a person who is righteous never says, I am righteous. They know better. So here's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. That's exactly the point. If Job were just like every other person except that God had given him some kind of gift, would there be any point in the whole book? Because God could turn to anybody. I, I guess I'll give you, we'll experiment on you today, I'll give you tomorrow, and I'll experiment on you tomorrow. No, the book here is because Job was really different. How did he get to be really different? That's the question of the book. His will became softened to the point where he could trust God. It all comes he absolutely trusted God. Yeah. Yeah, trusting God means trusting in His message. Yeah. It's not a matter of trusting Him with your life. Mm -hmm. Look at John the Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and Jesus. Uh, Jesus, of course. Are we kind of talking about Job here? Yeah, I mean, we are. I, I know, but at the end here, it said that Job told, told the right thing about me mm -hmm. as God. Yeah. So there's, some, there's an idea he has in his head that he told that was correct. And here we are, we're talking about Job and how righteous he is, when it could be Job has an idea that's correct that everybody should listen to about God. Okay. The devil knows God very, very well. Yes. Would you say he is righteous if, if, if someday he decides to spout some truth about God, which he does fairly often, 
Would you then call him righteous? Well, you said some truth about God, but there might have been something specifically in Job that, that is being spouted off here that nobody's spouting off yeah. except Job. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think we can say it's this little part of Job. I think we have to say, God, if there were some chink in Job's armor, Satan would have found it. Yeah, but th you're making my point there. Because, because what I'm saying is that there's an idea there that Job is trying to tell everybody something about God. And when he was done, God said it was true. Job told the right thing. So it's, it's you know, here we are. Do we, are we looking for what Job had said? Or are we looking how Job acted? And I don't think you can separate those two. I absolutely do not believe they can be separated. If you go Job 42, 8, uh, the latter part of it says, and the Septuagint says, you've not even told the truth about Job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, isn't a re it isn't a repeat of, uh, of uh, verse 7. It's, uh, not, God's concerned about Job's reputation, mm -hmm. and he, and he uh, lays it on him. But at the end, when, Job said, when God said that Job had spoken the truth, is he asking us to agree? I think we have defined truth. Yeah. What is the truth? Yeah. And the truth of the world is so different from the yeah. truth of God. Absolutely. But well, what was it that he spoke? Well, let's, let's look at some options here. One of the greatest proofs that God can be trusted is a method he uses to show that Job could be trusted. How did he do that? Was God, was God offended by Job's cries? When Job said, God, I just wish you would talk to me, please. I'm praying. You, you don't. We used to be friends. What's, what's wrong? I, I, I don't know what I did. Are, are, we, are you offended? You know, God was commending Job for what he did. The four were horrified by those speeches. You know, the real lesson, of course, this lesson is about, <laughs> is about Elihu, and we're just barely getting to Elihu. Elihu said, I wouldn't ask God to speak. To, well, I wouldn't ask to speak to God. I wouldn't give him a chance to destroy me. I mean, you know, the real reason is that God's approval of all that Job did and said says wonderful things about God Himself. I mean, we pointed that out several times. God has set His seal of approval to that kind of a method and that kind of a relationship. Imagine what that says about the kind of government God wants to preside over. So, do you think God is happy about people who behave as Job did? Is it the behavior or the belief system of Job we're talking okay. about? And, and this and is where we have to be careful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because all he did was sit on that hash heap the whole time. I mean, what do you, what do you look at? And, Other and than why? he, he why didn't... Why did he do that? I yeah. think that's important. Yeah. He and, sat on it in humility, mm -hmm. which is the beginning of wisdom in a way. Yeah. Well, okay. the only thing he didn't do was curse God and die. Yeah, well, we, you know, we've got to get to Elihu, so let's, <laughs> let's give Elihu a chance to say a few words. Here's Elihu's speech, starting Job 33, the first seven verses. And now, Job, listen carefully to all that I have to say. I am ready to say what's on my mind. All my words are sincere, and I'm speaking the truth. Aren't you glad you have somebody who can speak up for God here? God's Spirit made me and gave me life. Answer me if you can. Prepare your arguments. You and I are the same in God's sight. Both of us were formed from clay, so you have no reason to fear me. I will not overpower you. So, and then he goes on. Uh, look at, look at chat, verse 12. But I tell you, Job, you're wrong. God is greater than any human being. And then drop down to verse 19. God corrects people by sending sickness. What's he, what's he implying? He fills their bodies with pain. Job, we know what your problem is. Those who are sick lose their appetites, and even the finest food looks revolting. Their bodies waste away to nothing. You can see all their, their bones. They're about to go to the world of the dead. Perhaps an angel may come to their aid, one of God's thousands of angels who remind us of our duty. And mercy, the angel will say, release them. They are not to go down to the world of the dead. Here is a ransom to set them free. Their bodies will grow young and strong again. When they pray, God will answer. They will worship God with joy. God will set things right for them again. Each one will say in public, I have sinned. I have done right. I have not done right. God spared me. But he kept me from going to the world of the dead, and I'm still alive. So what's implied by all that? 
Well, seeing is believing. Look, Job, where you're at. Exactly. Do we have any idea at what point Elihu joined the conversation? Was he there for all the prior speeches? Um. We, we really don't. No, no. We, we, we can't tell from the text. Um, he seems to act as if he, he has all the answers. And what are the answers he gives? The answers of the world. <laughs> all, all the one answers that everybody else has already mentioned. That's right. He didn't come up with any brilliant new suggestions. Um, look at Job 34, 10 to 15, another part of Job's speech. Listen to me, you men who understand. Will Almighty God do what is wrong? He rewards people for what they do and treats them as they deserve. So, guess what, Job? You're getting what you deserve. It's obvious. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> Almighty God does not do evil. He's never unjust to anyone. Did God get his power from someone else? Did someone put him in charge of the world? If God took back the breath of life, then everyone living would die and turn into dust again. Job, you wouldn't even be alive if God was like you say he is. Isn't that the implication? If, did you add that? The last? Yeah, that last part, yeah, last sentence. Mm. <laughs> so here's the question. Could someone possess great power and use his might for evil? Of course. Can you name someone? <laughs> the devil, obviously, right? So Job's friends are saying because God is so powerful, he has to be right. Does might make right? No. No, not necessarily. And we see in Jesus just the opposite. Yeah. He didn't come with uh, physical outward show or power. He came in the power of the Spirit. Paul talks about that same kind of idea about God giving, keeping us all alive in Acts 17. He's speaking to the, to the Athenians. You know? Ellen White said, Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now that's a very poetic way of putting it. God isn't going <laughs> sitting there going like this, but that our hearts would not beat if it weren't for God's care for us at every moment. Um, well, I don't know how much time we should spend focusing on Elihu's speech, but it's basically a rehash. But if you believe that God mechanically rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked, then what other conclusion could you come to? So how do we get out of that box that so many people in the world seem to be in? Well, there's more than one factor then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if this is true and this is true and that's all there is, then this is the way it should be. But if there's another vector, another force acting on, and we see that in chapter 1 and 2, mm -hmm. there's something else going on. And maybe that's what Job is crying out for. What, what is going on? There's something that doesn't seem right, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what it is. The lesson goes, jumps God off. It's more complicated yeah. than some, yeah. some definition. When yeah. we define things, we make them finite yeah. so we can understand. Our, our Bible study guide jumps off from that point and says, there is no logical way you can explain the origin of evil. It quotes from Ellen White, says, it is, where she says, it is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. Now, we would all say he did create Lucifer, but it wasn't God's idea that Lucifer should rebel. There was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Great Controversy 492, paragraph 2 and 493. 
So what is she saying when she says that? Is she saying that, that the reason for sin came in is so complicated we can't conceive it? Or is she saying that it's unconceivable because it's not logical? Right. Most, mostly the second. She, what she's basically saying, there, there was no excuse for Satan to rebel. No, no, he had the knowledge was, of God. Yeah. Therefore, he chose to depart from he, it. it. Yeah, exactly. It was his choice that he went against God. Yeah, but it looks like it works both ways. If there's no excuse for him, then there isn't an excuse against him either. Well, yeah, there is. There's the whole, no, the, no, the no, whole government going, of God. You're going into logic now where we're talking about sin, which we can't talk about any logical reason for it. Yeah. So if you say that... If you live in a perfect world, you're created by a perfect God, you live in a perfect environment... You're using your reason there. Well, that's fine. That's what we're talking about. No, you that's, can't because that's where sin... We're talking about sin here. That's precisely the point because there, it, 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 it's a complete departure from anything logical. That's exactly what we're saying. There was absolutely no logic to it whatsoever. So just because so if no you use logic, logic to it, is it that it's sin? If you use logic, then he, there was no reason for him to, to rebel. No, you can't use logic. Part of the, We've just been told we can't use, be used logic. Part of the equation no. has to be love. We have to use Because it. there has to be a choice if, yeah. with love. And yeah. without choice, there is no love. Yeah. That has to be part of it. Well, well uh, and logic alone proves that in order to have eternal life, one would have to have perfect love, right? Mm -hmm. You want to depart from perfect love, logic tells you you can't have eternal life. Yeah, but how does, how does logic tell you what love is? God put that in our hearts to know that from the very beginning. Oh, he created I think that's him. the reason there. So God put it in your heart. He was... We're talking about heartfelt things here, and that's not really a logical thing. Oh, it is, absolutely. No, it isn't. It is, absolutely. When you talk about the heart, you're talking about emotions. No, where your heart is where you do your thinking. No, yeah. that's the Bible. Not, that's the Bible, not correct. the heart is where you do your thinking. Exactly. I've looked all over the place, and I, I think that's just a slant to look at it. The Bible oh, says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so, so, so is he. he. Well, it also simple. says in Deuteronomy oh. that you need to take things to heart. You need to take an idea to heart. Yeah. So okay. you've got it. That, that's that's thinking. thinking. That's no, thinking. no, you need to take it to heart. You start out thinking and you take it the to heart. heart. Is where you do your thinking. That's theological. Or way See, I, I don't agree with that. I think you guys have that off myself. If, but take ecology as an example. If we want to make sure that we preserve the world, we better know something about ecology or we won't do anything to preserve it, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with love. If we don't know what love is or if we refuse to accept the definition of love, which is total commitment to others, it, and we depart from that and we depart from God. See, if, if, God could have, if God could have solved the sin problem by making claims, the whole, the whole issue would be, all, the great controversy would have been over before it started. He doesn't make claims, he provides evidence. And it's evidence, it's evidence that the devil cannot argue with. At the very end, at the third coming. Going back to logic again. Yes. Uh, that's where we have to okay, go. Okay, but you just said that we can't, we can't explain sin through logic. That's, it's outside of logic, that's precisely the point. If it's absolutely not, nonsensical, illogical, that's sin. If it's logical, so we're, we're explaining the logic. And if you go outside that, that's the part that doesn't make any sense. That's where the devil is. Why that's would it. anybody depart from logic is the question. <laughs> Why would anybody depart by logic, from yes. logic? Yes. Yes. Well, we just said here that when we talk about sin, we can't use logic to explain it. Uh, well, I said you can't find a reason for it. Or which would, to make it you're saying exactly what I said. If you know the rule to, to, to stay alive, why would you depart from it and end up with death? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think Job would have said to God if God had said, Job, I'd like to use, a, use you as a guinea pig? Would Job have said, well, why don't you choose somebody else? <laughs> I mean, hey, he might have he gone along with it, you know. That I know a medical student from some years ago that said, if God could use me as a pawn 
to checkmate the devil, I would be willing. Well, do you think the devil was quite certain when that whole thing started that he would be able to get Job? I think the devil had a lot of experience with Christ. He got kicked out. He knew when the man said, don't kill him, that's exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. Well, Job suffered terribly. Jesus also suffered terribly. Do you think the 144,000 are going to go through some tough times before the final events in this world's history? It, maybe beyond the 144,000. I yeah. mean, the whole world is a microcosm of, yeah. or no, Job is a microcosm of what the world is. Yeah. So why, why is that necessary? Do we have to go through terrible times in order to be safe to enter into the kingdom of God? Whatever it is, it's a small investment for eternity, that's for sure. Well, I don't think it's a matter of having to go through that. It's a matter of a demonstration. These are the ones that, you know, as Revelation says, who can stand? And yeah. th these are the ones who can stand and will go through that time, and they uh, are glad to do so. Okay. God never asks us, this is a quote from Ellen White, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word, sorry, pushed it too far, and all, are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Steps to Christ, page 105. Now I'd like, we just have a few minutes left. I would like to look at the, I want you to consider three possible reasons why people do what they do. Job, did Job have enough evidence to trust in God? Well, he said so. So if you are a believer and are seeking to do God's will, what, what makes you willing to obey? Could you say, I do what I do because God has told me to and he has the power to reward and destroy? Is that why you don't murder or commit adultery? Because God has said you mustn't and if you do, he might kill you? Well, this might be all right for a beginner or a little child. And, and, and you know, little children don't do bad things or generally they they, they avoid bad things because they get punished if they do bad things. Well, um, so, but it suggests that God's laws are arbitrary, do not make good sense in themselves. That does not speak very favorably of God. Would you rather say, I do what I do as a believer because God has told me to, and I love him and I want to please him? Is that why you don't steal or tell lies? You would see nothing wrong or harmful about doing these things. It is just that you want so much to please God. For some reason, he does not like it when you steal or lie, and since he has been so good to us, you feel under some obligation to please him. It would only be grateful and fair. Again, this might be all right for a beginner or a child. It might even be progress beyond the obedience prompted only by fear of punishment and desire of reward. But it still implies an arbitrariness in God's commandments and does not speak so well of his character and government. There's another possibility, a possible approach to obedience. Could you say this? I do what I do because I have found it to be right and sensible, we might say reasonable, to do so. I have increasing admiration and reverence for the one who so advised and commanded me in the days of my ignorance and immaturity. Then hastening to add, being still somewhat ignorant and immature, I am willing to trust the one, uh, trust and obey the one whose counsel has always proved to be so sensible when he commands me to do something beyond my present understanding. That comes from a small book that's long out of print called I Want to Be Free by A. Graham Maxwell. So, in light of thinking about that, did Job win in this situation because he was good at leaping? Remember, a lot of Christians say that faith is a leap of faith. I mean, that, that Christianity or salvation is a leap of faith. You can only go so far with the evidence and then you just jump. Was Job really good at jumping? Or did he have enough evidence about God? 
These are, these, these are, these are well, challenging questions. Well, it pushed it beyond what his original comfort zone was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, uh, there was a s somewhat of a, not so much a leap, but, but a push. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and, and then he but here's the, here's, here's the question. No, let, me, let me be very specific. Did Job survive here because he had a really solid relationship with God before this started? Or did he just close his eyes and said, I choose, I, I choose to reject the devil. I'm, well, he didn't even know about the devil as far as we know. I just choose to do it this way because I want to. I, I'm going to leap. No, he knew God. The former, what you said. The former. Yeah, I, I think he had a very good relationship with God before this all started. And I think that's why God could say back at the beginning, you know, Job is blameless and upright. Well, are we willing to take that approach? Is it ever right or even fair to explain God's actions as a kind of simple cause and effect response? Good gets rewarded, evil gets punished. Is that fair? I think it's more complicated. But it's certainly more complicated than that in light of the book of Job, isn't it? Do you think Job or any of his friends knew about the devil? certainly knew about spirits because one of them mentioned it was like he got frightened by it. They yeah. weren't unfamiliar. They certainly knew how the devil thinks because that's how they thought themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but they thought they were representing God, didn't they? And that's the whole difference between Job and his people. A lot of harm is done in the name of God. Mm -hmm. Elihu, star Elihu starts out his speech implying that he has the answers. By the time we get to the end of his speech, we find that his answers are the worn out answers already <laughs> given by the other friends of Job. Well, we know about the rebellion of Satan. We know about the great controversy if we've done a little studying. Jesus, in contrast to the devil, was the very essence of humility. Satan, by contrast, was the opposite of humility, exhibiting pride, arrogance, and selfishness right in the throne room of heaven. So in this discussion. We are, of course, talking about Elihu, but we've seen very stark contrast between God's side and the devil's side, and we want you to think about it. Our kind and loving Father, we are so thankful that whereas Satan's way of doing things is illogical, nonsensical, completely insane, actually, all that you ask us to do is reasonable and sensible and logical, and we're, we're so thankful for that. May we come to understand you as Job did and be your, become to be your friend as Moses and Abraham and others were so that we may be ready for the day when you come again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.